introduction. Hello, everyone. Welcome to my talk about the glitch in the matrix. Um, despite the popular belief that this is a talk about glitching, it is not. I will actually be speaking about uh, compiler internals and how to bugify innocent source code with the help of a malicious compiler. And we better get this started because this is a very tight and dense talk. Hello, it's me. My name is Marian. Um, some of you might know me, some of you might not. We just determined I've been here at Hack.lu uh, for the fifth time now, and I love coming back here. I Two years ago, I moved to the United States for starting work with Intel. Intel, the chip manufacturer, not any three-letter agencies. And uh, that did not enable me to come here for the last two years, which made me very sad. So I'm super happy to be back at Hacktalk.eu and very excited. Um, but because I work for this big company now, I have to start off with a disclaimer and tell you that I do not speak for my employer and my opinions on stage voiced here are mine only. Also, I wanted to say that no database software was harmed in the making of this presentation. Any vulnerability that I'll be talking about in this talk uh, is perfectly artificial and only introduced through my malicious compilers. So don't expect any zero days. Now let's get to it. The fun about working on malicious compilers or malicious compiler plugins, as I did, is if you think about how many people actually perform security research on their own binaries that stem from their own source code, you will figure out that's terribly few. Most companies nowadays, most security teams focus on code review. Um, very few of them review make files. Very few of them review build chains. And very few of them review their compilers. And now, if you ask yourself, how bad is it that no one actually looks at the compiled binaries that come from the source code, you might find out it's not all that critical because modern day compilers aren't all that likely to introduce bugs into compiled code which is a miracle in itself. And if they do so, very, very few of them are actually security critical. So if we talk about the uh, functional checks that are performed on compilers, we look at a very thorough uh, testing line. What is though if someone like me gets into the build chain and switches a couple of buttons uh, just to see what, what happens on the other side? This is what we're going to be speaking about today. Let's start with a short introduction to GCC internals. And as you might notice, if you look into GCC internals, every presentation that was ever given in GCC starts with this graphic. Almost every presentation. This graphic shows you a 10,000 foot distance view of GCC internals as they look like today. GCC nowadays um, possesses a front end which parses common day languages into a generic representation. <laughs> that means if you compile C or C++ or Java, GCC doesn't quite care. The generic representation of all those looks more or less the same. Not exactly, but more or less. And from there, we go on into the GCC middle end, where this intermediate representation named generic is lowered into another intermediate representation named Jimple. From there, GCC performs the more language-specific optimizations. That means that the higher level languages can be optimized in a certain way, which is done in these stages. From there, GCC um, again, lowers this intermediate representation into the next intermediate representation, which is called RTL, which stands for Register Transfer Language. The RTL stage, or actually overall the compilation process, is organized in passes. So a compiler by itself might have the front, the middle, and the back end, but in between what's happening is that the execution of the compiler is organized in one pass after another, which gives us as um, compiler enthusiasts the feeling that things are happening sequential. So say in one pass, we lower uh, Jimple to RTL. In the next pass, we assign specific registers to the generic registers. In the next pass, we would look whether we can unroll some loops. And in the third pass, we would lower RTL into the uh, actual assembly representation. But Unfortunately, this is not exactly as it happens. You can imagine that GCC is a very complex animal, a very complicated 
uh, piece of software, which nowadays um, is comprised uh, comprised of about 14 million lines of code. And those 14 million lines of code do a lot, a lot, a lot of different things. Also, GCC is a compiler that grew over a long time, so you can imagine the source code to be somewhat creative. Nonetheless, the complexity of GCC for me personally is a big piece of beauty. It's very interesting to, to dig around and try to modify things. The last thing to say about the slide, interestingly, the last stage of RTL is where I spent most of my time as potential attacker inside of GCC. RTL is an, a generic description of an abstract machine. That means that once you enter the RTL passes, the compiler is still able to lower um, the representation of the code into any different architecture that is supported by the compiler. That means from the beginning of RTL, you could still lower down to x86, to MIPS, to ARM, or to whichever other architecture uh, GCC supports. This is implemented through the GCC backend, which defines how RTL is lowered into a specific machine language. We're going to have a little bit of a closer look at the RTL representation in a minute. First off, though, the most important concepts, if you want to go on and modify anything in the compilation stages, are the intermediate representations. The most important ones there would be Chimpel and RTL, as mentioned before. Chimpel is the higher, um, I'd say higher language representation of GCC. It's also called the three address code. Chimple looks very C-like. Chimple is more of like a C-like description of the input source code. And again, this representation is used for any given input language. So if you look at the statement that I totally stole from Wikipedia, the calculation that you see in the middle of the, of the slides, where there is a square root calculation or whatnot, this would be a typical piece of code that a, a C author would write, beautifully explained and with great variable names, as you can see. And uh, Chimple would go on and split up the statement into statements that Chimple can better optimize, which means that this would result into the block of code represented, uh, uh, the representation at the bottom of the slide. And so that means that Chimple takes the however convoluted source code that the developer produced and puts it into a very long, very simplistic representation that enables optimization to track, for example, to track variables as they travel through the code to see where data comes from and where it goes to in order for the compiler to make proper decisions about which code to eliminate, for example, and which code to um, press together or which code to unfold in later stages of the compilation. Um, as we move on to the register transfer language, here things look a lot different. As mentioned, RTL is an abstract description of the machine language output that GCC produces in the end. This looks very strange, as you will see in a second. RTL is used to implement the machine definition, which is essentially the language that the processor wants to execute. That typically comprises um, calling conventions that a, a typical function call would, for example, uh, receive an argument in a given register and return the return value in REX is things that are defined in the compiler. So the processor describes how it expects a function to execute and the compiler implements this definition. That includes um, optimizations that are targeted for a specific machine. So any optimization that can be performed on Intel architecture um, would be implemented in those RTL passes. And I promised you it looks funny. This slide shows you a call statement, like a function call. If you imagine a printf hello world, this is how it would look like in RTL, which is only the call instruction of the, the printf. Printf was replaced with a put string. As you can think, that was the compiler as well. That is, since if you only print like a constant value, 
like we have the hello world string constant in the in the binary, the compiler decides that printf is way too expensive to be executed and thinks that put string is way faster. Since we don't have any variable values that we need to replace in the string, this is the better option for the compiler to go. This is why we end up with a call put string uh, instruction in the output code. And as you can see, the other highlights on the top where you see set di and the dot lc0, this is the move instruction that loads the offset of the hello world string that's in our uh, read-only data. I think it's in the read-only data. I'm not to tell you something stupid. Anyway, so we have this constant string in the binary and we load the offset of it into the RDI register so that it can be handed over to the put string call. And the rest of what you see on the slide is the cosmetics that GCC requires in order to be able to translate this RTL instruction into an x86 instruction. Now what's beautiful about this is if you want to go inside of your compiler and modify things, you will be required to understand how these instructions are built and how you can actually modify them. So say you want to look for all the string copy calls inside of your binary. First you would need to know which pass is the, the, the good pass to find all the calls to string copy. Where are they optimized away if they're not used? Or where are they inlined if the compiler could inline them? So there's, there's different um, effects that need to be taken into, into consideration. Also, in order to be able to modify, for example, those string copy calls, we will need to be able to parse the RTL code, and we will need to be able to plug in uh, whatever we want to modify in the code. And to issue a warning at this at this point, anything that you want to modify throughout the compilation stages must be thought through perfectly well from beginning to end. Because as soon as you start modifying the code body, you shift around not only the code that's put out, but you might have to deal with the usage of certain registers. You might have to do, deal with the usage of different sections that the compiler will create later on. And you might have, you might be running into, into problems with your stack, uh, usage in the, in the program. This is all things like the stack layer of a, of a function, for example. It's all things that the compiler decides throughout compilation. So say you start modifying compiler output towards the end of the compilation process, then the stack layout of your given function might already be decided, and whatever you modify might have a side effect on the stack, which gives you very, very funny bugs in your compiled binaries. Okay, this was a quick introduction to compiler internals. To close with the introduction, here is a very illegible list of all the compiler passes that I could find in GCC. If you execute GCC with the command line switch fdump-passes, you get this beautiful list of all the passes that could be executed, um, including a, a switch that indicates whether with your, with your chosen optimization setting, the pass is executed or not. I know that this slide is absolutely unhelpful for you guys now because you can't, can't actually read it. This is just to demonstrate how many passes there are. So if you want to write a plugin or want to extend GCC, you will need to figure out where in this long list of passes is the good uh, moment for you to plug in to perform your, your modifications. Okay, at this point, let me say a sentence about why GCC. There is no perfect reason for why I started working in GCC. I'm aware that there is something called LLVM and Clang out there, which is way easier to get started on because you have proper documentation, you have beautiful structured source code. But what can I say? I work for a chip manufacturer and we have a couple of different interests of why we go certain avenues. And as it happens, I started working on GCC as my manager now about a year and a half ago came up to my desk and asked me, Marian, do you want a challenge? And I said, sure. And I did not know what I was going to do later. Okay, that was it. Now we're all specialists on GCC internals. Let's see what it is that we can actually do with those uh, skills. If we were an attacker that would be able to modify a build chain, then there are certain options that we could fancy for our bugification of output code. 
there's rather obvious things like changing buffer sizes, like removing a sanity check, removing an entire security patch, say Microsoft rolled out. No, Microsoft is a bad example, sorry. Say the Linux kernel rolled out a a patch that's neatly described and, and neatly described in the in the patch description. And we could go and say, okay, my compiler can look for this patch in the actual binary, and then say we could however unrealistic that is, we could recompile someone else's kernel and replace that kernel. We could remove the actual check through a compiler plugin. As it happens, the kernel actually has a very, very nice um, plugin infrastructure where we can just place a C file that contains our plugin into the kernel code and then we recompile the kernel with the usage of plugins enabled. Then we can actually compile the kernel with our plugins. That's beautiful. That was the... PAX team that came up with that infrastructure, if someone has heard about the PAX team before. All right, let's move on. The obvious stuff, though, um, is not easy, but rather straightforward. It's possible to detect this move, let's say, like that. So, uh, say someone removes a patch from binary. You might have heard about patch diffing, or like diffing binaries to find patches that were applied. We can do the same thing to find patches that were removed. We can also diff for code that was added to, to a source code. So you have source code you add through the compiler or a new piece of code through diffing. You would figure out that there is more code than you thought there should be in the binary. You can fuzz your binaries uh, naturally. You can reverse engineer and review your binaries if that's something you want to do. Most people don't. Um, I would always recommend to review your build script and of course to guard your build environments. Don't let anyone touch your compiler to begin with, just as I've mentioned. And yes, let's stick with the obvious stuff for a few more seconds. I'll show you how that could look like in practice. If we want to stay with the obvious things. Um, I started this whole adventure about looking into bugification of source code with a patch Turns out that a Project Zero, like a Google Project Zero researcher named Natashenka found a nice missing check in the Escalate database source code where there was a copy operation happening and that copy operation would look for a dash in a file name. And if a given file name wouldn't contain that dash, then the copy operation would go on forever. Escalate's problem was that the database itself was creating those files. It was read. It was intermediate uh, files for, for it to use. Um, but if a researcher would replace those files with uh, custom uh, created files without those dashes, then the bug would be triggered, and Escalate would crash. And I took it on to look for that patch in the in the patch source code and try to teach my compiler to remove it. And this is where we're going to have a look at the first demo. Or maybe not. No, not. Sorry, I was too early. Confused. Nothing happened. You didn't see anything. Okay, what did I do there? Um, on the left side here, I don't know if that's readable, you can see the unpatched version of Escalate after I compiled it, and on the right side, the left, uh, the patched version. If we have a quick look at the patched version of Escalate, you can see that there is a compare instruction that's neatly highlighted, which compares a value with zero. There we see a check for a zero, another dash. However, um, I might have put the hat in the wrong in the wrong corner. So um, what happened with this bug was that for once this check for the dash was missing, which is a problem because Escalate crashes. But what I wanted to do though, just that the thing crashes, didn't help me to actually exploit that bug. So I went on to modify uh, a good piece of code of Escalate to be actually able to exploit this kind of bug and wrote a rather extensive plugin and removed um, lots of different things in order to be able to overflow my buffer and override the return value and actually execute code um, within Escalate. This screenshot shows you one of the checks that I removed um, 
to be able to override the buffer. Again, on the right side, you see the patched version with the, with all the checks in place. And on the left side, if you could read that code on the slide, you could see that this check is missing. Dim, dim, dim. Fast forward a couple of days of trying and trying, and trying later. I did manage to exploit this bug. Um, what you can see on this slide is a screenshot of my my very meager success. I, I'll admit at this point I'm not an, an, an exploit writer, so I just did most of the job through the compiler and went ahead, removed the patch, removed certain checks that were on the way to the actual bug so that I could just feed the application a string and the string would magically end up in my memcopy operation. Escalate at this point was still fully functional, so you can execute it in this in the stage uh, as you wish, except if you feed it a string that's too long and after a certain length contains a certain address, you will manage to exploit it. And because I'm lazy, I also put the actual code that I wanted to execute in the output binary because I can, and who wants to execute ROP if they don't have to? So what happened is that I put the exec l call into the binary and from the return in my vulnerable function popped an overwritten return address from the stack which pointed to my malicious function inside of the SQLite library, which in the end popped me a calc. Due to timing constraints, I kicked out that demo from the talk because we have much more fun stuff to look at, because this was way too easy. Again, if someone has control over your compiler, they can do anything they want with your output binaries. As mentioned though, such changes that I performed with this plugin might be rather obvious though. Now the question, can we be less obvious? In order to be less obvious, we need to look a little closer at compiler internals and see, um, uh, have a closer look at what the compiler is actually doing uh, to optimize the code. Um, looking at optimizations inside of GCC allows you to plug into GCC proprietary functionality and mimic its behavior in order to smuggle bugs into a binary that are a lot harder to find than those that I just described. What we can also do in there is make our bugs more configurable. As you can imagine, as I was unpatching Escalate, I left big traces. I removed entire portions of code that were used to check the input value. So the Escalate authors actually put lots of say checks in there to look, is that string too long? Is that string containing any funny characters? And so on and so forth. So like I went ahead and removed all of those. That's a lot of work that's also very specific for Escalate and very specific for this version because if the code editors decide to add another sanity check or shift one sanity check slightly in the code, then my plugin would fail in its um, modification. So what we want is we want to get closer to the compiler with the modification and we want to have more freedom in the configuration of our bugs. And one thing that is challenging in that adventure is to fit this all into one plugin. Any modification that you do in a binary, um, if you want it to scale and if you want it to not break anytime nearly, anytime near in the future, you need to do a lot of planning and designing for your, your plugin. Otherwise, as mentioned in the beginning, you're very likely to just break the output binary. And now, one thing to introduce you to the concept of what I'm talking about is the first example I wanted to show you. Um, has anyone in the room ever heard of dead store elimination? Anyone? Yes, one person. Okay, there we go. So dead store elimination is a rather unimportant back class that uh, is an optimization issue from compilers. Um, that store elimination means uh, that store elimination is not the bug class itself. It's the compiler feature that creates the bug in the end. That store elimination looks for operations, like for stores that are happening inside of the binary that do not penetrate um, memory that is used afterwards. If you think about cryptographic functions, for example, 
cryptographic functions frequently generate keys and use keys, and it's desirable that those keys disappear again from memory after they were used by a given function. That is so that others cannot simply dump the memory of a cryptographic application and pick out all the keys that the application used in the past. Because you might know that um, if you write something to memory in your application, you can free that memory, you can let your pointers hang around until the application dies. The content of the memory remains the same if it's not randomly overwritten by the application later on. So say you use a cryptographic key through at runtime and you do not erase that memory then this key might remain in, in memory and might be vulnerable to side channel attacks or other uh, tricky attacks that look at your, your application's memory. So what application developers do is they erase memory after the memory contained the given key, which typically looks like this. We have a key, which is a buffer. We have the length of the key and we have a zero and we write that zero over that buffer so that the key disappeared. Now for a compiler, this looks very useless. So we have a buffer that's not used anymore after, after this operation, and we write it full of zeros, and the compiler thinks, oh, this can be optimized away because it doesn't actually have any effect later on in the application. Now, compiler developers are aware of that, and over the last couple of years, as far as I can tell, have uh, done a lot to mitigate this, this problem. Uh, what do if we as compiler attackers step in and try to reintroduce that problem. I came up with a simple example, which is shown on this slide, which shows you a very, very terrible cryptographic application that is utterly unreadable on the screen. So let me tell you what it does. Um, this is an application which has a clear text buffer and an output buffer which will contain the encrypted buffer and an encryption routine. This encryption routine creates a runtime key which is called secret key and the secret key is created every time you want to encrypt a buffer. This is not a proper cryptographic application. Please don't use that code anywhere near a production environment. The keys that we derive are four bytes long. Just so you see what I mean. And we use that key to encrypt our, our buffers. And afterwards, as highlighted in pink, we erase that buffer. So we memset the, the buffer to zero so that our key disappears from memory and our incredibly long four byte key cannot be recovered. Now what I did is I simply wrote a plugin which goes through the source code and looks for memsets that operate on variables that are called key. Turns out if you go through applications that implement cryptographic functions, developers really like to name their key variables something something key. And most of them are aware that they need to erase them from memory after usage. So what I did, as mentioned, I wrote a simple plugin which looks for those memsets. And as you might be able to see in the upper portion of the second graphic, you can see a call to a memset. And in the lower portion of the graph, dun -dun -dun, that call has disappeared. At this point, if you're not very quick at reading assembly, don't worry, I'm not either. You just have to believe me that the call up there is the only thing that's missing from the portion underneath. I mean, sure to try to capture the same window that starts with LEA and compare and JBE and several moves and, and, and ta-da, the memset disappeared. Now with such an attack, this is very simple, this is very stupid, and um, I can also show you how the respective plugin code looks like that will be here. With such an attack, um, one would probably not work very long on the plugin because you simply walk through the code, look for those memsets and try to, to erase them. And the output effect is rather nice because those bugs happen. Compilers do that. It is a, a functionality of them to eliminate memsets that, that aren't uh, effective in the compiler's eyes. And what happens for a security researcher is that most of those cryptographic applications are reviewed on the source code level. This bug is very hard to find through fuzzing. I'm not aware of any fuzzer that looks for code uh, for keys that, that remain in memory. And this makes it very likely that such kind of bugs remain uh, for your personal exploitation tastes for, for a very long time. 
What you see on this on the slide is the piece of plugin code that I wrote for this attack, and you see it's not very long, it's not very complicated. It's, it's still kind of funky because it uses the GCC internal API in, in order to be able to modify. Um, this is Jimpo code, and in the pink highlight you can see the piece of code that looks for uh, the content, the, the arguments of a memset call and the variable that has a name that contains the three letters key. So this is what we're looking for. You might notice that you potentially create real functional bugs with such a simple plugin. And in real life, if you wanted to implement such an attack, you would better make sure that the source code that your plugin will be compiling doesn't contain any memsets that are required for the application to, to execute. In reality, if you would want to write, um, let's say, a weaponized, not, not weapon, um, an attacker plugin that works in a real, real environment, then your parsing code would be a lot longer and you would look for a lot more uh, corner cases in order to make sure that the output binary is still functionally sound once you, once you compile it. Now this was fun. In this aspect, there is a lot of options for us to create bugs in, in binaries. I call them itsy bitsy bugs. Again, there's modifications that are rather obvious, that are big, that require us to write entire new functions in the output binary. And then there's those little modifications that are less obvious. Most of them are very hard to find through fuzzing or diffing. Like for example, most binary diffing approaches look at the graphs of functions or the graphs of a binary to figure out whether there was new basic blocks added or whether any new functions appeared in the, in the output code. If you apply um, changes on the opcode line, there might be diffing tools that look at the opcodes. I don't want to tell anything wrong now, but I'm not aware at the moment of a binary diffing approach that looks at opcodes one after another. So say you change a data type in, in the output application. Say you change a long integer to a short integer, or you change a signed integer to an unsigned integer. This would be such tiny modifications in the binary that the regular fuzzing, uh, the regular diffing tools would not be able to detect that in the output code. Other options that we would have, I just mentioned type confusions. Type confusions happen all the time to developers. That is um, easy to put the fault on the developer if a type confusion is what you want to perform in your compiler. Again, it's easy to change signed into an unsigned type. It is easy to shorten a key. Say the developer actually did not use a 4-byte key, but they used a 16 or 32-byte key. You could go ahead and just shorten that buffer a little bit and make sure that the keys that are used are still functional. The thing can still encrypt. It's just that the encryption that it uses isn't as safe as it used to be before. Um, and yeah, finally, what is also very, um, very easy to hide is to attack application specific mitigations. Let's say our developers are very security aware and they implemented a function that they use for checking the sanity of all their strings. So before every operation performed on the string, we call this sanity check function, which checks our string and sees whether buffer lengths are, are okay, et cetera. And if such mitigations are present in the binary, it is rather simple for a plugin to pick them out and perform modifications on those specific mitigations. And what's interesting about such an approach is that the typical security tool looks at the default bugs. They look at standard back classes. They look into things that they expect from other applications to do. They don't look into something that's very application specific and mitigations that are typically uh, that are dedicatedly implemented for this one um, application. Finally, let's look at the thing that I actually wanted to talk about. So removing memsets to zero is, is neat. Introducing buffer, exploitable buffer flows in Escalate was fun, I'll admit. But something that was really, really fun was looking into compiler built-ins as a vehicle to modify enough to be able to exploit. 
So I came up with homemade off by plenty bugs. Um, the idea was to give the developer some control over the bug. As mentioned, if you have a plugin that statically produces one very specific bug for the application, you're vulnerable to, your, your attack is vulnerable to any form of modification. Say developers add a new line of code in your function, then the whole thing shifts and you might be off with your, your parser and such fun. So, if the developer could have some control over the malicious compiler, we could create much more creative bugs. In that sense, I wanted to piggyback onto some compiler optimization behavior. That compiler optimization behavior I'm talking about is the expansion of built-ins. Compiler built-ins, I will be talking about in the next slides, are a, um, a module inside of GCC that enables GCC to understand library functions in a way that it can optimize them in a machine-specific um, way. You have to imagine that libc is written for many different platforms and not necessarily optimized for many different platforms. So modern day compilers go ahead and come with their own understanding of libc specific functions. That means that, for example, um, memcopy. If we use a memcopy call inside of our, our application, then GCC looks at it and says, I know memcopy. I have my own understanding of memcopy and it can help you make your memcopy better. And this is what we see in the expansion path of the compiler. As an attacker, we can now say, here's a memcopy. This memcopy contains a magic value, which tells my compiler that this memcopy will be used for my attack. And we can expand the memcopy into one or two or three bytes more than the uh, source code would suggest. About built-ins, it's just mentioned that a compiler feature, which enables the compiler to take, for example, libc functions, interpret them in a machine-specific way and expand them so that they are more performant than the original call. The expansion process uh, works as follows. If we look at this rather useless piece of source code on the left side, you see that there is two calls to memcopy. One memcopy tries to copy one empty buffer into another empty buffer, and the other memcopy tries to copy a hello world string into a buffer. If you look at the output source code, the one memcopy was inlined and occupies this red block in the middle of the graphic, and the other memcopy was preserved uh, in a perfect way with like loading an argument pointer into a register and then calling the, the built-in. Uh, sorry, the, the function memcopy. Now, if we enable optimization, we see that the first memcopy disappears because it copies an empty buffer into an empty buffer, which is useless for the compiler. And the second memcopy is, first of all, expanded, and second of all, horribly optimized. So you see that these 13 bytes of uh, Hello World are copied not through memcopy, but through move instructions. And those move instructions use 64-bit registers so that this copy operation is rather quick and only occupies three instructions. GCC does it through the, as I would call it, built-ins module. So GCC has uh, intimate understanding of how a memcopy functions. It knows that there's a target buffer. It knows that there's a source buffer. It knows that there's a length. And it decides which instructions of our target architecture are suited best for this copy operation. So GCC goes ahead and expands those calls so that they look very fancy in the output binary. If you want to try, write a simple piece of C source code that executes a lot of mem copies with different lengths and different uh, buffers and see how the compiler decides to, to produce them. You'll be very surprised. As an attacker, we can now go ahead and look at this graphic together where we see that the expansion of built-ins, or in this case of mem copies, happens at the beginning of the RTL passes. To produce this graphic, I looked at um, uh, log files that GCC produces and looked at the actual calls of memcopy to watch out where those call memcopy functions disappear. And it turns out that there's one pass for the optimization step being a one, a two, and a three, where the calls all start to disappear. And this calls, uh, this uh, step is called expand. Now that's where the built-ins are expanded. As an attacker, we will now go ahead and tap into this expansion path 
to figure out where is the mem copy call that we're looking at, where is our magic value. And then we go and modify the expansion that's happening inside the compiler and add our one, two, three, four, five, whatever bytes that we want to copy extra. At this point, we would now have finally the demo where, yes, we have like about 50 seconds left and I will try to execute the demo because it's fun, more fun than the slides. Now let's have a look. So I have this beautiful C file in here, which I'll show you right after. Oh, here it is. This beautiful C file, which does nothing and looks for an authentication value, which is the auth variable that I have there uh, in the middle, which is set to zero. In theory, you would have like an authentication process, which eventually realizes someone authenticated and sets this value to one. And if the value eventually would be set to one, this is something that you have to imagine with me now. If this is finally set to one, then we could go and execute our uh, calculator. If it is not enabled, to, if it's not set to one, then the binary says, nope, go away. Now, if we go ahead and quickly compile this binary uh, without our malicious plugin, we go ahead and execute the binary and it says, nope, go away. By the way, the result that I'm printing there is a data dependency which makes sure that my mem copy operation in the binary doesn't disappear. It's not very pretty and the string doesn't make very much sense, but sadly it's necessary. Now, if we are an attacker and we have an attack plugin, we would call that plugin like this with a dash f plugin and then followed by the path to the plugin. And now if we execute GCC with that plugin, the results will look totally different and hopefully now we get a calculator. There we go. So what did we do in this operation? And I think I'll be dragged off stage very, very soon. Let's see. So, as promised, we had the victim variable, which is the auth. We have the mem copy call, which contains our magic number. In this case, it was 96. And we have a plugin, which compiles through the source code, looks for mem set, uh, mem copy, looks for the 96 as the magic value, and then decides to add an extra copy operation in the expansion progress uh, process to, to write an extra byte into memory. In the binary, that would look as follows. As you can see, the move instructions, the, uh, it looks like move APS, I'm sorry for that. So like, here's the move instructions that copy our buffer that uh, the mem copy operation wanted to do. And if you look at top of the screen where this little arrow is, you see that there is a one written to a Rex relative offset. This is the one instruction that I switched in through tapping into the expansion process, which overrides our auth value and writes a one into that variable which makes us execute our calculator. Beautiful. And if I had more time, I would explain to you how that works in detail. Um, essentially, we're plugging into two passes. It's fairly simple. In the first pass, we look for mem copy and the magic value. And in the second pass, we look for the instructions that are generated by that mem copy. And this way, we can follow the expansion and add an extra instruction in there. This is performed through the functionality of GCC's location T structure. Location T is something that GCC keeps throughout compilation, which tells us at any stage which part of the intermediate representation refers to which line of C code in the original code, which makes it rather easy to say, like, here was our mem copy. It was present in line number five. And in the latest stage of compilation, we look for everything that uh, belongs to line number five. And we have the whole stack of expanded instructions that RTL sees. The first pass, I've still not been kicked off stage. I'm surprised the first pass looks for a candidate and um, r recognizes the line number of the candidate that we're looking for. In our case, it was a mem copy, and we were looking for an integer of 96 as the magic value. And in the second pass, the modification pass, we walk through the RTL representation again and look for the line number for the location that we memorized from the first pass and see what this, uh, this location has spit out. Something to consider is that not every mem copy generates the same instant output, the same instruction output. That's because the expansion pass wants to do exactly that to create the right representation for a given mem copy. 
If we have a mem copy, the copy is three bytes. We don't need five instructions to represent it. If we have a mem copy, the copy is 500 bytes. We might need a couple more instructions to represent this or actually see an, a call in the, in the output binary. This is why we need the uh, location information to follow the representation in the later stage of the compiler. This illustration that you see at the bottom of the slide is how I inserted my extra sneaky insen into this expansion process so that the end representation contained one more move instruction than the compiler would have generated. Since I'm still not kicked off stage, I'll keep on talking. Here are some attic limitations. You need to do extensive crafting of your attack, otherwise you're very likely to break the output binary and create bugs that you did not intend to create. You need good testing to make sure your plugin functions and that it keeps on functioning. Because the funny thing about GCC is that they keep on updating things without telling you about it, because apparently no one considers people to work on the intermediate representations anyway, which is a curious case. Um, there's a lot of corner cases in binaries. Modern-day binaries are very, very complex, and there's a lot of things that can go wrong if you start flipping random bytes in memory. Um, so assumptions are very unhealthy. Then, yeah, unanticipated compiler updates, that's fun. And you might have certain target dependencies that might change over time as well. And of course, compiler setting dependencies, as you saw on the last attack, you needed something that would use, you needed a compiler setting that uses optimization. Because if there's no optimization, there's also very little expansion of built-ins. That means a lot of calls remain and very little actual move instructions will represent your mem copy. I'm almost done and I'm still on stage. Um, finally, what as a defender could we do against such attacks? Um, the question of reverse engineering a GCC compiler plugin is a very curious one. If there's reverse engineers in the room that want to try, I have a couple of plugins and I would wish you lots of fun looking at them. I don't think it's a very feasible approach to analyze such plugins. Um, they're still very, very obvious in the build chain now. It's like if there is an extra binary that shows up in your build environment that might be noticed. So the other option would be to go ahead and modify GCC itself. That implies that you would need to recompile your victim's GCC code. And that is not very feasible because it takes a long time and it is very, very, um, it, it catches a lot of attention typically. Yeah, binary code review is a fun thing to do as well, but again, looking for signed and unsigned bugs or like extra move instructions that pop on the source code is not very feasible as well, and reproducible builds is something I haven't looked into deeper, and turns out many other people haven't either, so that might be a nice defense mechanism, but I'm not convinced of that uh, perfectly well. But finally, what I actually do in my job is not offensive, but defensive work. So what I actually work on is looking at prototyping things that find such bugs, other than prototyping things that create such bugs. This was a hobby project of mine. That's that. I don't think we have uh, time for questions, but I thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be around later. Thank you. Thank you.